Good morning. Good morning. The scripture reading for today is from Colossians chapter 4, verses 2 through 6. Devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. And pray for us, too, that God may open a door for our message, so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ, for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. This is the word of the Lord. The word is good. Hey, well, good morning. Good morning and welcome to Trinity. My name is Jonathan. I get to serve as the pastor of our church. And if you are joining us maybe for the first time or recently, uh, we are concluding our series through the book of Colossians today. We begin a new series next week through the book of Acts. And we preached on that five years ago. And so maybe every five years we'll go to the early church and some of those fundamental dynamics. But we're going to start that next week as we celebrate God's provision for us over these five years. Um, I've been thinking about this word, captivate. Think about that word for a moment. What captivates your heart, your time, and attention? Everybody's captivated by something. Captivated. Like I beheld something beautiful and it captivated my heart for a moment. There are a lot of different ways that you could describe what it means to be a Christian, but I think one of the ways that we could describe a Christian is a Christian is someone whose heart is more and more being captivated by grace. Not a generic grace, but the grace that is found in the gospel, the the, the grace that is found in the person of Jesus Christ, captivated by grace. A Christian is someone who has moved from spiritual death to spiritual life. They've gone from darkness and isolation into spiritual light and acceptance family. This is what Paul has been talking about in the early part of this letter. And this new reality begins to captivate a Christian's heart. Okay, Grace is what updates the operating system of the human heart. But how? How does that happen? How do I get a captivated heart? Paul says you get plugged into the right source. You keep in step with the Holy Spirit. You allow his word, his gospel to dwell among you richly. Synonyms for being filled with the Spirit of God. I would like to be filled with God's Spirit. He sent him. Jesus left. He said, it's to your advantage that I leave. I'm sending the Spirit. Let the word of God, the gospel, dwell amongst you richly. i got to plug into something like that so that my mind, heart, behaviors are captivated. And yes, of course, it's going to transform the way in which you practice your faith. But Paul makes it a lot bigger than that. He says it's also going to change the way you live out the details of your life. So three things I'm going to walk you through as we close out this book. People who are captivated by grace are, number one, driven by a proper urgency. Number two, they respond with daring. And number three, they are renewed through love, all right? So people who are captivated by grace, number one, are driven by a proper urgency. Look with me at verse two. Paul says, devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful, and pray for us too that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. You can pray that for me while I'm preaching today. Pray that I might proclaim it clearly as I should or as I try. Be wise in the way that you act towards outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. All right. The gospel is generative. Do you know what that means? It means that it is spreading life. Everywhere the gospel goes, it is growing. Paul says this in the beginning of the letter. He goes, look, the gospel is growing in this little backwater called Colossae. It's about 80 miles from Ephesus. Nobody expected the gospel to go there. Yet we have this incredibly beautiful letter. You have influencers who have been coming in and try to erode the 
fundamentals of the gospel. Jesus and Jesus alone. We need a little bit of church. We need a little bit of piety. We need a little bit more knowledge. We need a little bit more experience. He goes, no, in the centerpiece of Jesus Christ, there is fullness. Jesus is sufficient. Jesus is enough. Jesus has brought you to life. The gospel is generative. Paul wants these, he wants a chance to be able to spread the gospel. He wants to keep talking about Christ. And so he says, look, you got to pray for me. We're going to get to this more in point two. He says, I would like to have an opportunity to share more. But he also says, you who are believers and not just apostles, everyone who follows Jesus Christ has the responsibility to take their faith public, to be public about their faith, not obnoxious or annoying or angry or coercive, but lovingly public with our faith. And so he says in verse 5, look at that one. Be wise in the way you act towards outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity, or as it's phrased in the ESV, making the best use of the time. All right, time. Do we live with an awareness of the clock? Now, I'm not talking about like pulling out your phone all the time and trying to pay attention to this awareness of the clock. Many of us are preoccupied with time. I like to run. I like to go up on those hills and run. It's like the only time that I put the clock away. Used to be driven by how fast am I going. Now I'm taking a moment to go, you know what? I'm not going to worry about the time because most of the time we are worried about our schedules. This is not what I'm talking about, a preoccupation with our time but with a proper urgency, proper urgency. Now, we live in a time and place where we are unwittingly being brought into this cascade, into this river of busyness and preoccupation. It marks our culture. It certainly marks North County, San Diego. And that is not to make anybody feel bad about their use of time or if you have a full schedule. I would think that I kind of have a full schedule. Most of you have full schedules. The Apostle Paul certainly had a full schedule. And when you read through the Gospels, you know what we see about Jesus? Most of the time, it felt like he was going somewhere. It felt like he had an agenda. It was a people-focused agenda, and he's willing to submit it to anybody who would call his name. But Jesus was busy. This is not to make anybody feel bad about their schedule. But the question is designed to help you stop and consider, is my life guided and propelled by a proper urgency. Michael Zingarelli from the Charleston Southern University School of Business conducted the Obstacles to Growth survey of over 20,000 Christians across the globe, and he identified busyness as a major distraction from spiritual life. Here's what he wrote. Listen carefully to his hypothesis. He says, it may be the case that Christians are assimilating to a culture of busyness, hurry, and overload, which leads to God becoming more marginalized in Christians' lives, which leads to a deteriorating relationship with God, which leads to Christians becoming even more vulnerable to adopting secular assumptions about how to live, which leads to more conformity to a culture of busyness and hurry and overload. C.S. Lewis, in his well-known screw tape letters, he adds to this. He says, you will find, you know, this is a conversation between an elder demon and a younger demon and their attempt to prevent a Christian from following hard after Jesus. Okay, so that's the context for screw tape. Lewis writes, you will find that anything or nothing is sufficient to attract his or her, the Christian, his wandering attention. You no longer need a good book, which, is, which he really likes, to keep him from his prayers or his work or his sleep, a column of advertisements in yesterday's paper will do. You can make him waste his time not only in conversations he enjoys with people whom he likes, but also in conversations with those he cares nothing about on subjects that bore him. You can make him do nothing at all for long periods. You can keep him up late at night, not roistering, but staring at a dead fire in a cold room. All the healthy and outgoing activities which we want him to avoid can be inhibited and nothing given in return so that at last he may say, I now see that I spent most of my life in doing neither what I ought nor what I like. We live in an attention economy. Everybody knows that your attention is for sale. 
It drives business. It drives profits. It drives markets. One contemporary writer said, your attention is the beginning of devotion. Very important concept. If they can get your attention, then they might just get your devotion. And if they can get your devotion, what, me- what this means is that most likely your money will follow, or most likely at some point your worship will follow. Attention drives commitments. What you give your thought life to, mind and heart, drives your behaviors. I've been haunted by this quote by John Mark Comer in his book about unhurrying, the ruthless elimination of hurry. Here's what he writes. He says, do you ever catch yourself with a sneaking suspicion that you'll wake up on your deathbed with this nagging sense that somehow in all the hurry and the busyness and the frenetic activity, you missed the most important thing? Somehow you started a business, but you ended a marriage. You got your kids to their dream colleges, but never taught them the way of Jesus. You got letters after your name, but learned the hard way that intelligence is not the same thing as wisdom. You made a lot of money, but never grew rich in the things that matter most, which ironically aren't things at all. You watched 14 seasons of fill in the blank. But you never learned to love prayer. There wasn't a proper urgency to your life. In sports, there's a phrase that gets thrown around, and it's this. The clock determines the play, right? Even if you're not a sports advocate, you think you understand what this means. First play of the Super Bowl, you know what's never going to happen? A Hail Mary, all right? First play, Super Bowl, nobody's going to rear back and just launch this thing towards the end zone on the first play. But guess what? If you're down by six with five seconds left, you better believe that the clock is going to determine the play, that you're going to do everything you can. That quarterback is going to do whatever it takes to put the ball in the end zone to his preferred receiver in order to try and win the game because you're about out of time. Anybody watching the Masters this weekend? I don't know exactly who's winning. Do not check your phone, all right? Do not check and see yet. you got a few more minutes. But if you are up by three strokes in the Masters, you are not going to drive the green in order to get an eagle on 18. You are going to play conservatively in order to stay in bounds. And I'm a horrible golfer, right? I'm trying my best with this illustration. I don't know if that even sounds right. Stay in bounds, eagles, all those things. But if you, you're just trying to stay conservative. But if you know you're about to lose down by three going into 18 with this being your first major, you might just try it, right? Anybody watch the national championship, uh, the men's national, national championship? Most of you probably watched the women's, which I think was last Sunday. But a lot of people also watch the men's. More people watch the women's for the first time. Did you know that? Yeah. Way to go, ladies. Less people watch UConn versus Purdue. I don't care if you picked uh, UConn, which I did. I didn't want UConn to win again. Nobody in this room wanted UConn to win back-to-back Dan Hurley championships. Shame on you. All right? (laughs) Nobody wants this to happen. And so with a few minutes left, I'm yelling with my kids at the Purdue point guard in order to Hurry him up. He heard me. He tried. right? But you're yelling at the television. You don't have time. You have to create a moment. You have to create offense. The clock determines the play. Let me get out of sports for a moment. Think about your children. I've got a 14-year-old who looks like he's an 18-year-old. And he's going into ninth grade in the fall. And I am thinking about, like, 14 of the 18 years are behind me. Like it happened like this. And so I'm starting to say, the clock determines the play. What do I want to impart to my son before he graduates? And so when he turned 13, we began meeting intentionally for discipleship one-on-one, twice a week with some other fun sprinkled in because I wanted to impart what I could so that on the day that he leaves for college, that I would not have any regret about the way in which I imparted faith to him. Penny's about to turn 13. We're about to start it with her. Aaron, who's like my 10-year-old, I think he's going to be a pastor. He's got that soft heart. He's like, Dad, when are you going to start this with me? Like, he's ready. I'm like, in a few years, son. No, but if they're hungry, you give it to them, all right? If they're ready, you go. But I waited till 13 with those because the clock determines the play. 
I don't have that much time left with my children before they are out in the world formed living for him or not. We're living through a season of cultural life marked by searching and sadness and frustration and anger and wandering and self-definition. And so many people are wondering, did I define my life in the right way? There is this search for meaning that is being funneled away from God. You know what's the result of this? The Bible tells us from the very beginning, dysfunction, worry, anxiety, hurt, frustration, division. This is what we're experiencing. You see it full on. You see it in every headline. You see it where you work. This is the world that we're living in. People apart from the God who made them are searching, hurt, and wondering, and wounded, and saying, what can fill up the human heart? They have funneled all of these ambitions towards man-made ends, but it can't support the weight of the human soul. And as Christians, we go, look, I know something that can. I know something that can support the weight of who you are as a human being. And the greater crisis isn't cultural, it's eternal. Yes? Heaven and hell hang in the balance. And eternity with God or eternity separated from him and everything that is good and true and beautiful is what we are talking about. Look, the gospel is good news. Jesus came to save people from sin, Satan, hell, and God's holy wrath. Anyone can be mission-driven. Apple is mission-driven. Microsoft is mission-driven. Your local barbershop is mission-driven. But Christians are the ones who are driven by the mission of God and the gospel. And this urgency of time, a proper urgency to use our life and conversations in order to make much of Jesus in our generation. Make the most of the time, Paul says. A Christian is someone compelled by Jesus' kingdom vision, and they live to seek it first. That's what it means to be a Christian. It's not like, like the holy Christians are supposed to be the ones who seek first the kingdom of God. No, everybody who follows Jesus is supposed to seek first the king and his kingdom. They have surrendered their time as part of laying down their lives at Jesus' feet. And they pray, your kingdom come, which we just prayed. Your will be done on earth through me as it is in heaven. And let me be honest as I transition. Your schedules, if you begin to pray this, may or may not change. The early disciples, what were they before Jesus met them? Fishermen. After Jesus departed, what did they keep doing? Fishing and preaching. First thing we see, they're back in their boat. Your life may or may not change, but Christians who are captivated by grace have a sense of the clock and what's truly at stake in the lives of people around them. Yes? All right. Proper urgency. Number two, people who are preoccupied by grace. Number two, respond with daring. Look at verse two. Paul says, devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. And pray for us, too, that God may open a door for our message, that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ, for which I am in chains. Pray that I, I may proclaim it clearly as I should. Now, you know full well where the Apostle Paul is not writing from. He's not writing from a sandals resort in southern Greece, is he? He doesn't have a Mai Tai in hand, kind of giving some advice. He is writing from a Roman prison. And when he invites the Colossians into a shared ministry of prayer, notice that he does not ask them, pray for my release. It's not what he asks. I'm in prison. You know that. I've never even visited Colossae. I've got friends. We've got mutual friends who brought the gospel here. When he asks them to pray, he doesn't say, pray for my release. What does he ask them to pray for? He asks them to pray for an open door to proclaim the gospel, the mystery of Christ, now revealed as grace for rebels and renegades. He goes, that's the more important thing going on right here. I'm in prison. Of course he'd like to get out, but he's looking for opportunities for the spreading of this message. One of the most effective church planters, missionaries, and Christian leaders, he knew that his effectiveness in ministry depended on the prayers of his church. This is the Apostle Paul. 
These are people who are not educated, haven't been Christians for very long. And he goes, will you join me? I need your help. Will you pray with me through an open door? Paul seems to be saying, doors will open if you pray. Doors will remain closed if you don't. And it does not say that every single door you pray for to be open. Jesus, I would like the door of the lottery to be open for me. He says, if I pray for open doors, some good stuff's going to happen. That's not what he's talking about here. Specific marriages, right, specific relationships, specific opportunities, uh, your CV being padded, the, the, how much money you have at the end of your life. He's talking about specific doors to pray for that will open for the spread of the gospel. They will open if you pray. As one writer put it, Paul is asking people to pray the locks off of people's hearts. Do you love that? He goes, join me in this ministry. Let's pray the locks off of people's hearts. How? He says, devotedly. That's the word he puts with it. Devote yourself to this. Or as one translation says, steadfastly, watchful, and with thanks. So let me illustrate that. Paul says, devote yourself to prayer. Mark chapter 9 got a Bible turn there. Mark chapter 9. I'm going to be in verses 17, 18, 19. Just for a moment. Mark 9. Jesus' disciples are confronted with a demon that they cannot drive out of this young boy. And this boy's father has approached the disciples. He's asked them for help. And here's a little bit of the description we're given of this boy. This young boy was possessed by a spirit that had robbed him of speech. He couldn't talk. He was mute. Whenever it seized him, it threw him to the ground. He foamed at the mouth. He gnashed his teeth. This is verse 18. And he became rigid. And the father looks to Jesus and he says, I asked your disciples to drive it out, but they couldn't. They have success throughout the Gospels in these moments of driving demons out of people. But in this case, they couldn't. And so a crowd begins to gather. Jesus finds this little boy. He ends up exercising the demon. He releases him from the oppression. He restores him, lifts him to his feet, gives him back his health, gives him back to his father. And so later in the afternoon, the disciples are with Jesus, and they go, look, man, we've had success in the past. What happened with that little boy and his father? To which Jesus replied, this kind can only come out through prayer. Some translations add, and fasting. And you know what's amazing? Jesus did not stop and pray and fast when he went to that little boy and began to exercise the demon from his life. He had been devoted to it already. He wasn't like, all right, call a prayer meeting. This is a tough one. I'm going to need some help on this one. Everybody get around. No, he doesn't do that. He goes, this one can only come out through prayer and fasting. He doesn't pray on the spot. He's devoted to it. This is who he is. This is who Jesus was. Prayer and fasting marked his life and character, leaving an indelible imprint deeper in Jesus than in any other life. This kind can only come out through prayer. No human strategies, no master classes, just a simple instruction that the door for this young boy's release and redemption could only be opened if people People prayed. Devote yourself to prayer. You know what this means? Devote yourself to prayer, not as a program, but as a way of life. I'll talk about that in a moment. A way of life. Tyler Staten in his book, Praying Like Monks and Living Like Fools. I like that title. He says, we have an appetite for the grandiose. God has an appetite for new life. We can't resist public spectacle. God can't resist the secret labor of prayer. This is a consistent devotion of followers of Jesus who have made seeking first the kingdom of God, the quiet yet consistent rhythm of their life, rhythm of their families, treasuring Jesus in the secret place that David describes in Psalm 51. Jesus, I'm not here to meet with you on a mountaintop. I'm going to the secret place devoted to you because of the gospel because my heart has been captivated. I want to be with you. Prayer is primarily about connection and communion with God. It's that simple. Like if you don't know him, 
then you won't want to be connected to him. If you know him at a shallow cursory level, then prayer is always going to struggle in your life. But when we are captivated by grace, taken captive by the love of Jesus himself, we enter into prayer with a Savior who ready, wipes tears, who ends shame, who swaps places, who offers us his righteousness, and who declares the end of condemnation. And Satan says, when that's your story, all that matters is remaining in love. That's prayer. Captivated by him, and I'll do whatever it takes to have communion with this type of God. When that's your story, all that matters is remaining in that love. I'm going to pull this to a close with an extended reading of a story um, about a man named Duncan Campbell, who is a pastor in the Hebrides uh, in the 40s and 50s, actually just in the 30s and 40s. Anybody ever heard or read about the Hebrides revival that took place in Scotland? Just out of curiosity, anybody heard of the Hebrides revival? Very few people. Yeah, Hebrides revival. Stories told about Duncan Campbell, one of the key leaders in what became known as the Hebrides Revival. And the Hebrides Revival, which occurred primarily on the islands of Lewis and Harris, not mainland Scotland, small islands during the 40s and early 50s, was marked by significant spiritual awakening and transformation. Amazing story. Would love to have you read a book about it. Come and ask me about the recommendation. But here's a bit of that story, all right? Let me read this. On the Monday after Easter, 1952, Campbell was seated on the platform after speaking to the Faith Mission Convention in Bangor, Northern Ireland, when he sensed an inner voice say to him, Bernaray. That is a small island in the Hebrides. Duncan bowed his head and prayed silently. Again came the name Bernaray. He prayed on, and the name came a third time. So Campbell turned to the chairman and whispered, Brother, you will need to excuse me. The Holy Spirit had just told me that I need to go to Burnaray. And the chairman objected mildly, you are the speaker tomorrow. I don't blame him. Well, who's going to preach? Right, we're going to need somebody to fill in for you. But nothing could stop him. He knew the Spirit had spoken. He reminded Wesley du uh, Duell, who was telling this story, I had never been to Burnaray, had never known anyone from there, and had never received a letter from anyone there. He went to the hotel, packed his two suitcases, and, and contacted the airport. There were no connections with Bernaray because it was too small and out of the way, so he caught the first flight to the nearest island. When he got there, he went down to the coast and asked how to get to Bernaray. The answer from a fisherman was there was no usual commercial way, but that he would take him for such, and such an amount. It was almost the exact amount that Campbell had in his pocket. When they got to Bernaray, the fisherman returned and left Campbell standing alone on the shore. Picture that for a moment. He climbed the bluff and he found himself on the edge of a plowed field and a farmer not far away. And he said, please go to the nearest pastor and tell him Duncan, Duncan Campbell has arrived. And the farmer responded, oh, we don't have a minister for the church right now. Well, do you have elders, Campbell asked. Yes, all right, go to the nearest elder and tell him Duncan Campbell has arrived. The farmer looked at him quizzically, then started off across the field as Campbell rested on his suitcases. And after a while, the farmer returned and said, the elder was expecting you. He has a place ready for you. He has announced the meetings begin at 9 o'clock tonight. While Campbell had been ministering in the convention at Bangor three days earlier, this elder had spent the day praying in his barn for God to send revival to the island. God gave him the promise in Hosea 14, 5. I will be as the dew unto Israel. He claimed it in faith. His faith, his wife in the house, heard him praying in the barn, quote, Lord, I don't know where he is, but you know, and with you all things are possible. Send him to the island. He knew in his heart that God was going to send Duncan Campbell, who had been used in mighty revivals in other parts of Scotland to burn array. He was so sure that he would be there in three days that he made all the arrangements to use the local church and had announced the services. And here's how this story concludes. Wesley Duell goes on to say that great revival came to the island of Bernaray, and a great door for the word was open that no man could shut because God had opened it. He draws out this lesson. When God has people who prevail in prayer and people who know how to recognize the voice of the Spirit and obey without question, there is no limits to what God can do. 
Amen? Amen. Like, like when I read that story, there's like this mild skepticism in my heart. And then I go, Lord, do it again. Do it more. You did it in the 40s and 50s in the Hebrides. Do it again. You're doing it all over the world. Do it here. And let me just tell you, God did it here this week. People who are outside of faith coming into the family of God. And I can't wait to be able to tell you that story in time. God is doing it here. But we want to pray more and more that God does this. Be devoted in prayer. Make the most of every opportunity. Paul even says, don't be boring. You know what he says? Let your conversations be seasoned with grace and seasoned with salt. Like you're the vehicle. If you are dull and boring, they're not going to want to know about your Jesus. Have a good conversation with someone. Let them see the love and the grace of who God is. Make the most of every opportunity. Live with a proper urgency. Devote yourself to the king at the center of the story because prayer is only and always about him. And let's step back and see what he might do, not just in the Hebrides in the 40s and 50s, but in San Diego, right here, right now, in our generation. Would you like to see that happen? Then I do. Jesus, forgive my skepticism that you could do that. Come and renew in us a belief that when you spoke it, you meant it that somehow we can pray the locks off of people's hearts. Maybe that's you today. Maybe that's your life. Let's pray the locks off of them and see what Jesus does. Let's pray together. Jesus. Jesus. Holy Spirit, be present with us. Move in our heads as we think. Move in our heart as we consider. What are we captivated by? Because whatever it is, it's going to drive our attention. It's going to drive our devotion. And prayer is only and always about being devoted to Christ because he is first devoted to us. He's laid down everything for us. He's wiped tears. He has restored a young boy to his family. He has healed our sin by taking it into himself. This is the good news. And Paul says, I'll stay in jail if I can have more opportunity to talk about Christ. Jesus, would you Pray the locks off of our skepticism. Let the Holy Spirit to move upon us to pray. Holy Spirit, move in us. Heal the skepticism.
save them. Come and get them. And if that is your name today, say it to him. Come and get them. Move upon me like you've moved upon millions. Let the life of Christ become personal.